So Torah and Science Part 3 of the series, this one is about Kabbalah and quantum physics. So we talked about Kabbalah already before. We had like a three-part series about fundamentals of Kabbalah. So this is, we're going to review a little bit of that and add a lot onto that. Just quickly, what is Kabbalah? We talked about this before. This is more of like a recap of what it is. So we want to summarize that and then go into the quantum physics, right? The most, uh, the most advanced physics that we have, the most microscopic, the quantum world, wild world of things that, what's going on over there when we zoom in, when we try to actually figure out what is the universe made of, what is the nature of reality? That's what we want to get to today. And there's a lot to discuss. So let's see how deep down that rabbit hole we can go. Maybe we won't get to the end. Yeah, let's see. So Kabbalah, we know is Jewish, means is Jewish mysticism. It means receiving. That's reception, right? Le Kabel is to receive. So I like the analogy of a receiver. That's why I put a picture of a little radio receiver over here. Uh, because I make Mekubal, somebody who's like a Kabbalist, is a receiver of godliness right so we all right now you're all sitting in your rooms and you don't probably don't hear music assuming you don't have music on but you probably don't hear music but there's of course music everywhere in your room your room is full of music right now but you just can't hear it but then if you pull out a radio and you turn it on and then you'll hear all kinds of music right whatever depending on the radio station that you tune it to you can have all kinds of music and it's all in your room right now you know flying through the walls and flying through you in the space all around you you can't hear it because our ears don't pick up radio waves but we can build machines that pick up radio waves and then now you can hear the music right? so if your ears could hear radio waves let's say then you'd be able to hear that music so Kabbalah is using that analogy, right? Being like a receiver of God, having the tools to be able to see God everywhere. In the same way that you can't see radio waves, they're invisible. But you know that they're there. If you have the receiver, you can tune into them. Otherwise, they're invisible. So it's kind of like that with God too, that God is generally, we say, is invisible. We don't really see God. But with the right tools, we can tune into the, that frequency and see God everywhere and hear God everywhere. So the Kotzka Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic leaders a long time ago, 19th century, said that one who doesn't see God everywhere doesn't see God anywhere right? because God is everywhere. So if you're tuned to the right frequency, you see God everywhere. And that's what we hope to accomplish today, that by the end of the next hour, that you'll see God everywhere. That's the goal. And the Baal Shem Tov, who's the founder of the Hasidic movement, the modern Hasidic movement, I guess. Modern, I mean, like in the 18th century. Because there were Hasidim Rishonim. Now, like the Gemara talks about the early Hasidim. So can't confuse. There's actually, there's at least three or four groups of people in Jewish history that were called Hasidim that have nothing to do with each other. Like there were the ancient Hasidim, like in the temple times. And there was the Hasidim of Hasidei Ashkenaz, the Hasidim in the 12th, 13th century in Europe, and Germany specifically. Uh, and then... The modern Hasidic movement, and so there's various groups of people called Hasidic. So Baal Shem Tov is like the founder of the what we today call Hasidim. So he he summarized kind of Judaism by saying, God makes things spiritual things physical, and the Jew makes physical things spiritual. So that's that's kind of like Kabbalah in a nutshell. And for more information on Kabbalah, go back to our previous three classes. The recordings are available, so you can see those. Quantum physics, we're talking about Kabbalah and quantum physics. So what is quantum physics? Quanta is like the tiniest unit of energy, let's say, that you can just like boiling the universe down into the smallest possible thing. And it's called a quanta, like a little quantity, the smallest possible measurable quantity that we can have quantum physics and ultimately the goal is to figure out like what is reality what gives rise to matter and the ultimate ultimate goal is to find the grand unified theory the gut the gut like what is the one thing that could explain everything in the what that can unify all the forces that can explain gravity and electromagnetism and the nuclear forces and everything that can explain 
everything, the whole cosmos, all the forces of nature. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so quantum physics is like the most advanced physics, the most microscopic physics. It's different from classical physics. You know, classical physics, like Newtonian physics, just breaks down when we zoom into the quantum world. All of that classical physics just doesn't work, seem to work anymore. We need, there's like a new set of rules at the quantum level when we zoom in as much as possible. Like when I say quantum, I mean smaller than atoms, smaller than even the subatomic particles like protons and neutrons, even smaller than that. Like we're talking about really electrons and photons and similar particles, like the smallest thing, like electrons and photons, the, the interactions between them, photons being particles of light. So that's quantum physics. Um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, just to, to, to point out here, he said something interesting that, you know, of course, Judaism, fundamental to Judaism is the belief in one God and the quest to seek unity in all things. Like we're trying to see the oneness in everything. That's what we do every day. We say Shema twice a day, if not more, uh, which is all about unity, right? That God is one, that we are one. God is one. We are all one. Everything is one. The whole universe is one. Seeing the oneness. It's not that there's, the Shema is not saying that there is one God. That's obvious. The Shema is saying that everything is one. It's about oneness. It's about recognizing the oneness in the universe. And the Rebbe said that what's truly remarkable is that this idea has also gained prominence in the sciences. And now, you know, the most science today is looking to express everything as some single formula. So to discover the single unifying force which underlies all other forces, so that all other forces are shown to be aspects and outgrow outgrowths of the singular force. So science is looking for the grand unified theory. What could explain everything? So it, it, with that in mind, Kabbalah and quantum physics are really kind of the same thing. Right? They're, all, they're both looking for the oneness, the one explanation to the universe. What is that one thing that can explain the whole universe? And quantum physics is so strange that some of the greatest quantum physicists in history, mainly in, like in the past century or so, say things like Niels Bohr, for example, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it. Richard Feynman, who we mentioned before, I think I can safely say that no one understands quantum mechanics. And Erwin Ir Schrodinger, who's one of the sometimes called the father of quantum physics, said, I don't like it. I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. It's <laughs> Schrodinger. Schrodinger is the one that actually came, uh, came up with these equations that we use called Schrodinger equations, really advanced, complex stuff, Schrodinger equations. You might, maybe you remember a little bit from high school. Uh, we, we, you don't do it in high school, but we just, we mention it in high school. Uh, so Schrodinger said that he's sorry he ever had anything to do with it really, really crazy so what is it really uh what are some of the implications of quantum physics uh there are there are many aspects to it but i think one of the most interesting and one of the most bizarre that nobody understands why is what is going on is this notion of wave particle duality that all things are both particles and waves so the schrodinger equations that i mentioned they talk about everything. They can describe everything as waves, like describing all matter as basically waves and not particle. Like you can have a particle, which is like very solid and, uh, you know, has a very clear, obvious, like fixed place. Whereas a wave where it's spread out, you know, uh, waves are not, not like particles. It's hard for me to explain, but I think you understand the difference between them, right? Like, let's say you have a pebble in your hand that's a particle, let's say that's a particle, and you throw it at a pond, and then it makes ripples in the pond, and you have waves, and right? so you can see the difference between the waves and the particles, two different things, and yet we find that all matter can behave like both particles and waves at the same time, and what's even more bizarre is that what seems to determine whether something's a wave or a particle its behavior is actually affected by the presence of an observer of some measuring device of, or a consciousness or a measuring device of some sort. So when it's being observed, when something's being observed, it becomes a solid particle. 
So I'll, this video uh, explains it much better than I will. So just watch this. Granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense, but physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this?
So just to summarize that, uh, you fire particles. It's, this is the famous double slit experiment. You know, you fire particles and you would expect two slits. Right? You fire waves, you get an interference pattern. And then when you do that on a quantum level, for some reason, firing particles makes an interference pattern, makes a wave pattern. How does that make sense? We're shooting particles. Why are we getting a wave pattern? Then you try to see what's going on. You put some measuring device. And by putting the measuring device, now it behaves like a particle and you have two bands. You remove the measuring device and it's a wave. You put a measuring device, it's a particle. So the observer, the measuring device affects the result of the experiment which is completely baffling. Is it a wave or is it a particle? It's both. And the presence of that observer of a measuring device actually affects the results. So I'd recommend there's a documentary with a BBC documentary with Jim Al-Khalili, who's like a famous BBC personality and also a physicist. And he actually goes through the thing. It's called, I think it's called Secrets of Quantum Physics or something like that, or Secrets of uh, Quantum, something like that. Uh, you can probably watch it on YouTube. And he actually goes through this and shows the apparatus of how they do this experiment and explains it in detail. And one of his taglines in that documentary is like the, one of the implications perhaps is if nobody is looking at the moon, is it really there? Because it seems like when we, when there's no observer, things are just waves of potential. And only when there's an observer, when there's some measuring device, do they actually become particles. So if nobody's looking at the moon and nobody's observing the moon, is the moon really there? It's like that old philosophical question. If a tree falls in a forest and, you know, and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? You remember that question? The tree in the forest. But the, the quantum version of that is if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there, is there a tree falling in the forest? Did the tree even fall in the forest? <laughs> Right. Is there a tree in the forest? So it seems, of course, like it should, like it doesn't seem to make sense. Modern, what uh, Wolfgang Pauli said, he's one of those other the great physicists of that generation, the night of the first half of the 1900s, that modern particle physics turns the observer once again into a little lord of creation in his microcosm with the ability at least partially of freedom of choice and fundamentally uncontrollable effects on that which is being observed so he's saying that like each per like you the observer is like a little lord of creation we create the world around us we observe our world into existence almost so we mentioned uh poly before when we talked about the number 137 there it is again because we said how uh, 137 is this the fine structure constant, this number that represents, that's tied to this concept, but that represents this, the interaction of electrons and photons and so on. And, and we quoted various sources before and saying how if this number was even a little bit different, a little bit off, uh, life just wouldn't exist. Like the, the universe wouldn't exist. Like elements couldn't form, everything would fall apart. So uh, many physicists believe that 137 is the most important number in nature and physics. And we saw how this number appears all over the place. And we talked about how Richard Feynman, for example, one of those great physicists said that any good physicist should have this number up on their wall and think about it all the time, the number 137. And what's amazing about it, as we said before, is that 137 is the gematria in, in Hebrew of Kabbalah, right? Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, Kuf is 100 and Bet is two and Lamed is 30 and He is five. So the value of Kabbalah is 137. So in Judaism, the number that represents the deepest mysteries of the universe, and in science, the number that represents the deepest mysteries of the universe, it's the same number, which is really incredible. Right? It's hard to say it's a coincidence. And Wolfgang Pauli, the reason I bring it up is because Pauli knew that. They knew that 137 is the gematria of Kabbalah. And they knew that that just couldn't be a coincidence. That's just too phenomenal that this ancient number and modern and this modern mathematically derived scientifically derived number are the same and so there's this whole book which i also recommend reading it's a great book it, the book is called 137 and it's about carl jung and Pauli and the pursuit of a scientific obsession how they were really into jewish mysticism really into kabbalah it's not mentioned in this book but i read elsewhere like carl jung i think thought he was the reincarnation of rabbi shimon bar yochai uh the, the the person whose uh, whose teachings make up the Zohar. Okay, so these people, Carling wasn't even Jewish. 
uh, but he was very much into Jewish mysticism. And so was Pauli, and so were many physicists at that time. So wave particle duality, we, we see it also encoded in the Torah a long time ago. Ravitsa Ginsburg points this out, something fascinating, that the word for a particle, the smallest possible little particle in the Torah, the word is an egel. So for example, the, the term egleital, like little particles of dew, right? the smallest particle, like a dew drop, right? Tiny, 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 like the smallest little drop is, is in Hebrew an egel. And the Hebrew word for a wave from the Tanakh again is a gal, right? Galim, like gal is a wave. So in Hebrew, the word for a wave is gal, and the word for a particle is an egel. And it's really amazing, Rabbi Ginsburg points out that the, the root is the same. Right? You have the same root for the word for a wave and for the word for a particle in Hebrew. It's also quite amazing that already thousands of years ago in the Tanakh, Hebrew being this divine language, it encodes all these secrets within it. So just like we have wave particle duality in Hebrew and Egel and Agal, Gal, Egel, Egel, Gal, right? same roots, same letters, really amazing. The key here is who is actually observing us. The reason that we all understand that if I don't look at the moon, it's still there, right? Like if nobody's home, if you, nobody's home in your house, that doesn't mean that your house isn't there anymore. Now your house is still there. Right? And the mailman can still come and, and put some, leave some mail or whatever. So even if nobody's observing it, like your stuff doesn't disappear. So that suggests that there's something observing all of us. Like, why don't you wink out of existence and dissolve into just like, let's say, waves when you go to sleep at night? That doesn't happen because something is observing all of us. And I think that's what Max Planck, Planck, the father of quantum physics, he's, he's off the, so it's either like the father of quantum physics is a title that either goes to Schrodinger or, or, or Planck, like depending on who, which school you're from. Uh, so he said like this, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms, this, as a, uh, about atoms this much, there is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. So Max Planck is saying that based on what we've seen, the universe, it looks like, has a mind, an observer, like a great observer who is observing all of us, a consciousness that is actually holding each atom together right? because we've seen that particles seem to only be particles when observed so perhaps there's some universal consciousness that is observing all of us all the time which sounds kind of very similar to you know the jewish belief in a god that's always observing you at all times yeah so there's a consciousness in the whole universe the mind is the matrix of all matter. And this idea is becoming more and more popular today. Just some new newspaper clippings, just a quick Google search. Is the universe conscious? And you get all kinds of headings from all kinds of scientific uh, sources and NBC also, not so scientific, but scientific American new scientists. Is the universe conscious? It seems impossible until you do the math. Uh, some of the world's most renowned scientists are questioning whether the cosmos has an inner life similar to our own. Physicist Gregory Matloff argues that a proto-consciousness field extends through all of space. Uh, consciousness pervades the universe. Why some scientists believe the universe is conscious. So the whole universe is conscious. So going back to Kabbalah, that was the quantum physics part. We'll come back to it. But one of the potential implications of this is that the whole universe is conscious. What does Kabbalah say? So Tikkunei Zohar, which is uh, one of the parts of the Zohar, the Zohar, which we mentioned before, is like the main kind of textbook of Kabbalah. It's not actually one text. It's made up of many different texts put together. And one of them is the Tikkunei Zohar, which gives 
uh, the whole book is actually about the first word of the Torah. Amazing. So the first word of the Torah is Belashit, and the Tikkun Zohar, basically 70 chapters and 70 explanations of the word Belashit. The whole book is on just explaining the first word of the Torah. And one of those explanations is Belashit Rosh Bait. So it's saying if you rearrange the letters of Belashit, what does it mean? Rosh Bait. Rosh means head, right? mind, head. Uh, the head is associated with the mind. Bait, which is house, right? place. Veraza de Mila, and this is the secret of the verse in the Tanakh, in Proverbs, Bechokhmai Banebai. So in, in Proverbs, in the Tanakh, we, we read, this idea is found in a few places in the Tanakh, that of course we know that God created the world with wisdom, Bechokhma. So like the simple way of reading that verse is that God is very wise and created like an amazing universe and everything is so complex and so intricately connected and fine-tuned. And so he created the world with wisdom. But what the Tikkun Zohar is saying is that it's a little more than that. It's that the whole bite, this whole universe that God created, which is his, we say it's his lower house, his home, this whole universe is God's head. So when, when we say that the deeper meaning, Bechokhmai Banebait, is that God built the whole universe in the Chokhmah, like the wisdom is inseparable from the universe. God's mind is one with the universe. Bereshit is Rosh Bait, that the universe is some, like contained as if in God's mind. And the Lubavitch Rebbe, in one of his Sichot, it's actually quoting from the Tanya, that he's saying that we know that God created the world through speech, and we'll come back to that later, because God spoke into existence, or God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be, and there was. Saying, so the physical world was created through speech, but the whole concealed world, all the heavens, everything, everything beyond all the other dimensions of reality that we mentioned in previous classes were actually just brought up, come about through God's thoughts. God thinks everything into existence. So the whole universe is a product of God's mind. And this connects to what Rashi is saying. Rashi is kind of supposed to be supposed to be a pshat commentary, a simple commentary on the Torah, and he says, that God is the world's place, but the the place of the world, but the world is not His place. Meaning, the world does not, the universe does not contain God. God contains the universe. So all these ideas are kind of talking about the same thing in different words. The universe is within God, within God's thoughts, within God's consciousness. Which leads to a, a number of implications. If we put it all together, our minds have an effect on the world around us. That we know now scientifically. We have clear empirical proof that an observer has an effect on the world around them. In some ways, we create the world. Like Polly said, that we are like a, our own tiny Lord of creation. And our minds, we have a mind too. We have consciousness. God has consciousness. God brought about the universe with thought, with consciousness, and imparted some of that to us. He made us like him, right? He made us in his image. We have the abilities, some of his abilities too. He gave us some of his abilities. The Zohar, did I put that here? Uh, where did I put it? Oh, I put it here. Uh, I'll, co I'll come back to it. But uh, God gave us the same abilities that he has. So we have also very powerful ability, very powerful thoughts and speech, like God and action. And we see that, that's a, that, that manifests itself in our day-to-day -day life. We just don't notice it. Something like the placebo effect. Probably all heard of the placebo effect, right? Person takes a pill. The pill is not a real pill. It's just a sugar pill. 
but the person doesn't know that. The doctor said, here, this is a new treatment is going to make your whatever problem go away. And the person believes in it. He's convinced that this pill is the real deal, takes the pill and is healed. And it, but in reality, it's just a sugar pill. So how did that person get, you know, get better? Just a sugar pill. But just by their faith, their belief that this is going to help them, it helps them. Now, the placebo experiments have gone very far. Today, they've even done, you can look this up later. I can send you an incredible video about placebo surgery, where they trick people into thinking that they've had surgery, but they actually didn't. And it's just as effective as the people who had the surgery. So there's one video I've, I've shown before I can share with you of, of actually showing a knee surgery that was done for people with arthritis. So half the group had the knee surgery and half didn't. And both the results were the same for both groups. Both groups got better, like 60, it was like two thirds of both groups got a marked improvement in their whatever knee pain and mobility and so on. So w whether you do the surgery or you just believe you do the surgery, the result is the same. How is it possible? What's healing? Is it the surgery that's healing or your own mind that's healing? Think about the effect, the placebo effect, how strong it is. And it's not just our own. We, we affect the people around us. This is related to the concept of, of Ainara, of like the evil eye. You know, if somebody's thoughts can be so powerful that they can harm another person. And we all do it without real, not evil eyes, but like we all have an effect of our thoughts affect the world around us all the time. We don't even realize it. Uh, so these things happen. It could be other coincidences, but we know that this is real. We know scientifically that our thoughts uh, affect the world around us. We know scientific, the placebo effect is measured, it's real. Uh, every drug before it goes on the market has to go through placebo trials to make sure that it's more effective than a placebo. And many drugs aren't. When I was in university, I remember I had one professor who was involved with a particular drug. And <clears throat> he told me that that drug didn't really pass placebo trials, but it was sent to market anyways. Uh, but it was only as good as the placebo, but it went to market anyways. I'm not going to say which drug it is in case somebody's on that drug, but like, it's not even as good as the placebo, <laughs> right? So this is real. So it should, hopefully the drugs are better than the placebos, but not always. And even the Rambam, the Rambam writes in his, in, he was, you know, the Rambam, we mentioned before class started Maimonides. So the Rambam was a great doctor. He was the physician of, of the king of Egypt at the time. Uh, in the 1100s, and he writes that really his medicines are only effective when he promises them to be effective. Like when he tells the person, the patient, like this is good stuff. This is going to heal you. Just take this, you know, and call me in the morning. You'll be much. You'll be fine. And he didn't say call me in the morning uh, because it was in the 1100s, and they didn't call back. Uh, anyway, so he, the Rambam says that his medicines are effective when he promises that they will be effective and the patient believes that it'll be effective and then they're healed. I think Benjamin Franklin said that the best doctor is the one who knows the uselessness of the most medicines. Um, <laughs> it's not, that's not totally true. No. Modern medicine is amazing, obviously, and helps a lot of people. So that doesn't mean that you should now never take medication and just you know, placebo all your problems away. It doesn't necessarily work like that, but in theory you could theoretically theoretically if you had if you had the mental capability refined to a very high degree then perhaps you could and that's why i put a a picture of rabbi Chaim kanievsky here because he's one of the people who's still alive and he has many long years ahead he's one of the people whose um, whose blessings are known to work he gives somebody a blessing and, and the blessing comes to like miracles, like people who couldn't have children or people, all kinds of miracles. People come, he gives them a blessing and it works. How does it work? There's two aspects to that. Of course, the classic, the classic, the simple answer is that he's a great rabbi, a very spiritual, high spiritual person. And we say that when a tzaddik like that says something, God says, all right, you know, 
that tzaddik gozer v'ashem mekayem, that a tzaddik says something and God says yes, because it's, you know, the, the power of the tzaddik. There's a spiritual power that his blessing has. If we look at it scientifically for a moment, we can also look at it in a different perspective that he, this person is a highly refined individual with a very powerful ability, very powerful mental ability. And so we can see scientifically why his blessing has power. You know, if the whole universe, there's this divine consciousness to the whole universe, and God is part of that consciousness, and Rab Chaim and others are connected to that consciousness, you know, and can tap into that, there's real power there. There's real power in their thought and in their words that they can affect another person. And what's most amazing, I specifically took, put his picture and not another rabbi, because there are other great rabbis, because I just finished one of his books, or uh, Yosher, and over there, he actually, very humbly, he says, he answers this question of why did, it's not necessarily in that specific book, it's like a book with other, uh, part biography, part Orchot Yosher, his book, and uh, says, he humbly said, why do his blessings often work? So he said, it has nothing to do with me. And of course it does. But he said he was very humble. So he said, my blessings have nothing to do with me. He said it has to do with the person who's coming to me. If that person believes, has strong faith, then my blessing will come true. Because they have such emuna, such faith in Tzadikim and in the Torah and in God, that it comes true. And for people who don't have such strong belief, it doesn't necessarily come true. Uh, Michelle, I'm just reading your, your chat. And yes, it's true. I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> so he was saying that it's, it's very much also, it's not just, it's not about necessarily so much about his own, that he is so great. Of course it is. But it's also about the actual person who's coming to get that blessing. It's about their own emunah. Okay? How much real, how strong is their thought? Because with your thoughts, you can really cure anything do anything just that usually we don't believe it we don't believe in ourselves we don't realize how powerful our thoughts are there's three levels there's thought and there's speech and there's action action we all know we all know how to work with action but we don't realize how powerful speech and thought is and that's really what emuna is emuna is the power of thought one of the like, classic questions is what is the difference between emuna and bitachon. Very classic question. We say that the person has to have bitachon, like has to have trust in God, and has to have emunah, has to have faith. What is the difference between two, those two? Because they seem to be hard to differentiate. And sometimes I've seen people try to explain it, and they say the same thing. They say emunah is this, and bitachon is this. But they actually said the same thing in different words. When you think about it, like, wait a minute, you're saying the same thing. What, what is actually the difference between those two? The difference is, bitachon is having trust in God. So, we all have challenges. A challenge comes your way. And you're wondering, why is this happening to me? Bitachon is having trust that this is happening for a good reason. I trust Hashem. If this came my way, that means it was meant to happen. It was meant to happen. That's bitachon. I trust that it's happened for a good reason. I'm going to get over it. Everything will be fine. God only wants what's best for me. That's trusting in Hashem. Trusting that everything that he does is, is good. Everything's meant to happen. And that's it. Emunah is something different. Emunah is power, your mental power. Emunah is tapping into that God consciousness. It's like connecting to Hashem. Emunah is the thought, not just thinking that everything that's happening to me is happening for the for a good reason, but actual expressing that godliness into the world around me, actually affecting the world around me with a God consciousness. That's emunah. We see it from the Torah because the first place of the word emunah appears, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time that the word appears as a noun, as a verb, it appears before that Abraham believed in God. But as an actual noun where we see emunah, the word emunah appear, does anybody know where it appears? Where does the word emuna appear? The first time. Pretty sure it's the first time. 
it's where Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, when they're in the battle with Amalek, when they come out of Egypt, when the Israelites come out of Egypt, and Amalek, the you know historical cosmic enemy of Israel, comes right away to attack them. And in that battle, we read how Moses was standing on the, he wasn't in the battle, Yoshua was leading, he was like the actual general who was leading the physical battle. And Moshe was in the back, you know, on a hill, kind of overseeing the battle and fighting spiritually. And it says he was holding up his hands and it says his hands were emuna. What does that, what does that mean? What does that mean? His hands were, his arms were, he was holding up his arms and his arms were emuna. What does that mean? And the Torah is clear that Moses' emuna was affecting the outcome of the battle. Like when he could hold his hands high or whatever, the Israelites would be winning. And when he lost it, he lost his focus, the Amalek was winning. So that's Emuna, his mental power affecting the battle in front of him. That's where Emuna first is, is, is talked about in the Torah. That is the case. It's not, it's not like, it's not bitachon. It's actual tapping into God's mind. That's Emuna. In the end of Masachet Makot, the sages say something amazing in the Talmud. They say, of course, Moses gave us 613 commandments. And they say King David came and was able to summarize them or categorize them into 11 principles. He was able to boil down the 613 mitzvot into 11 principles. And then it says the prophet Isaiah, Ishayahu, came and boiled it down further to six principles. And then it keeps going to three and to two and so on, various prophets along the way. And finally, it ends by saying the prophet Habakkuk came and boiled it down to one principle. Everything, the whole Torah comes down to one principle. What is that one principle? Said the, the verse in Habakkuk, Tzaddik be'emunato ichye. That the Tzaddik lives be'emunato in his faith or his emuna. No faith, I don't think faith is the right translation. But the whole, everything boils down to just emunah. The whole Torah boils down to emunah. Tzaddik be'emunato ichye. That a tzaddik can affect the world around him with his emunah. He needs nothing else except emunah. If you have really refined emunah, you can accomplish anything. That's the power of emunah. We see that in Pirkei Avot. We're going to start reading Pirkei Avot soon, between Pesach and Shavuot. And it says there, Aser atzoncha kirtzono. You make your will like God's will. You align your will with God's. You align your consciousness with God's consciousness. Yeah. You know, it just goes back and forth. If you do like his will, he will do like your will. You align your will. If you nullify your wills, your human-based desires, and you do his will, he will, he's going to nullify everything that's going on around you to do your will. So, you know, do, that's the idea. Do his will, make your will, his will, make it one. Align your consciousnesses. That's emunah. That's the power of emunah. We see that whenever the, 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 this emunah comes in. So there's a scientific aspect of this, a scientific power to thought that quantum physics shows us. It's real, emunah. The power to affect the world around you with your faith. One of the, so with this idea of a conscious universe, one of the amazing implications of that that this is Stuart Hameroff, came up with a theory together with Roger Penrose, another very famous physicist, of, of if the universe is conscious, what does that really mean for our minds and our souls? Something really amazing. One of the problems that neurology has had for a long time is figuring out where's the brain's hard drive. Like it used to be thought that the brain stores information somewhere, right? Like you have some chunk of the brain like, like the hard drive on a computer, that's where all the information is. But there is no hard drive. Like the brain doesn't have one part that stores data. So where's all that information? So there's different ideas. So this is another one, so watch this. Dr. Stuart Hameroff is the Director of Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona, Tucson. 
He's also a practicing anesthesiologist. Okay, everything is going to go real smooth. You just pick out a nice dream, and you'll wake up feeling really, really nice. Under anesthesia, patients don't dream, even though I said pick out a nice dream, we always say that, but there's no awareness, there's no passage of time. Patients wake up, they don't know if they're being asleep five minutes or five hours. Anesthesia takes away consciousness. The brain under anesthesia is quite active, and the difference is, is still somewhat mysterious. Years watching over patients in the operating room made Hameroff obsessed with understanding the link between brain activity and consciousness. Then, 15 years ago, he met the great British physicist, Sir Roger Penrose. Together, they developed a radical new theory for how the brain works. A theory that has grown into nothing less than a scientific argument for an eternal soul. At its root are tiny structures inside our brain cells called microtubules. If you look inside a cell, you find these structural components that are somewhat like the bones within our, our bodies. The microtubules develop literally a forest inside each cell, which determines the architecture and the structure of the cell. And we think microtubules are perfectly designed to be the cell's onboard computer and process information at the molecular level. Hameroff and Penrose argue that microtubules allow neurons and the brain as a whole to function as a quantum computer, performing operations in a fundamentally different way from normal computers. So here we have a brain with two hemispheres. Most views of the brain are of a collection of individual neurons. When one neuron fires, it sends a signal to the next neuron at a synapse. That in turn causes that neuron to fire, and that neuron causes another neuron to fire, much like dominoes. So for example, if a neuron fires here, it's going to trigger its neighbors to fire, sending signals through and around the brain. That's the classical view of how the brain works. In a conventional computer, signals move around from place to place along traceable paths. But the microscopic components of a quantum computer are connected via a mysterious process called entanglement. Some of us think that quantum processes play an important role in consciousness in the brain. So for example, if there's neuronal activity here, it may be coupled through quantum non-locality to processes over here. These neurons are connected even though they're spatially separated so that activity here instantaneously affects activity over here. Hameroff and Penrose argue that a change in the microtubules in one brain cell can affect microtubules in another. But that's not all. Quantum theory claims that every single point in space, even empty space, can contain information. At the very fine structure of the universe, there is information, quantum information, not unlike these dominoes, so that we can have information up or down, here and here, but they're connected, so that something that happens here influences something here. This means the information in the microtubules can connect and become entangled with the universe outside the brain. So just like these two neurons may be entangled, it's possible that the information of consciousness of the whole brain is entangled and can exist in the universe at large. According to Hameroff, our souls are built from something much more fundamental than neurons. They are constructed from the very fabric of the universe. I'm going to continue that in a second. Just stop it there. What they're saying is that the actual information that we think is in our brain could very well be not in our brain and actually stored in the universe itself. Kind of like the universe would be like the cloud. You know, like you have your phone, you have all the data there, but the data is like really in the cloud. And then if your phone breaks, it's just like the physical thing, whatever. You get a new phone and you just, from your cloud, you get all your data into a new phone and that's it. The data was never really in the phone to begin with. So the same thing with the brain, that the brain is only a receiver, again, that receiver term, and it's picking up the information that's actually stored in the universe. It's going back to this idea of a conscious universe. The whole universe is a mind.
The whole universe is chokhmah, is information. Remember the Tikkun Zohar said the whole universe is chokhmah. The chokhmah iban abayit. Chokhmah is information. Chokhmah, the, the Kabbalists say, is koachmah, the power of what? It's information, it's data. I think the whole universe is chokhmah. And all of that, all of our knowledge, is not necessarily in our brains. It's in the universe at large. And we're just picking up. We're receiving information from the universe. Let's say the heart stops beating, the blood stops flowing, the microtubules lose their quantum state. But the quantum information, which is in the microtubules, isn't destroyed, it can't be destroyed, it just distributes and dissipates to the universe at large. If the patient is resuscitated, revived, this quantum information can go back into the microtubules and the patient says, I had a near-death experience. I saw a white light, I saw a tunnel, I saw my dead relatives, I maybe even floated out of my body. Now, if they're not revived and the patient dies, then it's possible that this quantum information can exist outside the body, perhaps indefinitely as a soul. Many scientists find it difficult to believe that the soul is a quantum computer hardwired into the cosmos. But Hameroff feels that research is slowly validating his claims. Quantum effects have recently been shown to control several important biological processes, from bird navigation, to photosynthesis, to the human's sense of smell. So far, nobody has landed a serious blow to the theory. We're still very viable, and evidence continues, uh, new evidence continues to support the ideas that we put forth 15 years ago. So the, the near-death experience, the near-death experience idea, right? Millions of people around the world have reported having near-death experience. I know people personally that have had a near-death experience and were able to access information that they couldn't have otherwise known. They felt their souls come out of their bodies and they saw things, they heard things, they flew across town to see their families. I know somebody who experienced this, who actually, who then got information from what his family was doing across town and then was resuscitated and, and knew information that he shouldn't have known. Like this really happened. Like this person's soul came out of his body. So how does that work? So Stuart Hameroff, this person who was speaking here, he has an idea that it works because your, your mind, your thoughts, it can exist outside of your body too, right? The information is out in the universe. And then if a person's revived, it can come back into that person. It can explain reincarnation. Right? That same information can come into another person. And that information can live on. That's so you have a scientific explanation for basically a soul, for an afterlife, for a person's thoughts and memories existing outside of their body, even after their body decomposed. That information is never destroyed, that the whole universe ultimately, again, comes down to information. And that's what quantum physics and, and Kabbalah really agree on all along, that everything comes down to information, quanta, little packets of data of information of energy the kabbalists would say everything comes down to the basic letters you know the, of creation god, that god created the world the 32 paths of wisdom which we discussed in the past um do you guys have 10 more minutes to go a little further or is this like too much yeah <laughs> okay so just to finish with the grand unified theory how can we explain every what is what are some candidates for the grand unified theory today? And currently, probably the most popular is called string theory. Okay? That the one thing that can explain all things, we can reduce the whole universe to a set of strings. Okay. So I'll, I'll let uh, Number Brian, one, if Brian there Green are more it. dimensions of space, where are they? We don't seem to see them. And number two, does this theory really work in detail when you try to apply it to the world around us? Now, the first question was answered in 1926 by a fellow named Oscar Klein. He suggested that dimensions might come in two varieties. There might be big, easy to see dimensions, but there might also be tiny curled up dimensions, curled up so small, even though they're all around us, 
that we don't see them. Let me show you that one visually. So imagine you're looking at something like a cable supporting a traffic light. It's in Manhattan, near Central Park, and it's kind of irrelevant. But the cable looks one-dimensional from a distant viewpoint. But you and I all know that it does have some thickness. It's very hard to see it, though, from far away. But if we zoom in and take the perspective of, say, a little ant walking around, little ants are so small that they can access all of the dimensions, the long dimension, but also this clockwise, counterclockwise direction. And uh, I hope you appreciate this. It took so long to get these ants to do this. <laughs> but this illustrates the fact that dimensions can be of two sorts, big and small. And the idea is that maybe the big dimensions around us are the ones that we can easily see, but there might be additional dimensions curled up sort of like the circular part of that cable, so small that they have so far remained invisible. Let me show you what that would look like. So if we take a look, say, at space itself, I can only show, of course, two dimensions on a screen. Some of you guys will fix that one day. But anything that's not flat in the screen as a new dimension goes smaller, 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 and way down in the microscopic depths of space itself. This is the idea. You could have additional curled up dimensions. Here is a little shape of a circle, so small that we don't see them. But if you were a little ultra microscopic ant walking around, you could walk in the big dimensions that we all know about. That's like the grid part. But you could also access the tiny curled up dimension that's so small that we can't see it with the naked eye or even with any of our most refined equipment, but deeply tucked into the fabric of space itself, the idea is there could be more dimensions as we see there. Now, that's an explanation about how the universe could have more dimensions than the ones that... So that's the idea with string theory, that you can have all kinds of dimensions curled up and as Brian Greene was saying, that even in empty space, like we think that's empty space, there is no real empty space, that even in empty space, when you zoom down real, 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 real to the, to the lowest, to the smallest level, you would have these strings, these little vibrating strings that give rise to the entire universe. That also goes back to what Stuart Hameroff said in the previous video, that even empty space contains information. Our minds could be linking to every part of the universe at large so string theory is one of these amazing new not new so no so new anymore but one of these things that's a candidate for the grand unified theory that might might explain everything depending on the types of strings and how they vibrate that would give rise to different particles and then particles we understand and the particles come together and make what we what we know quarks and then protons neutrons electrons and so on so everything boils down to tiny invisible vibrating strings and when we think of vibrations it, it kind of takes us back to the torah because <clears throat> vibrations speech is a vibration too and the torah always the torah tells us that uh, god created the world through speech God spoke and the world came. What is speech? Speech is vibration. That's it, right? Like when you're speaking, that's vibration. That's energy. That's making vibrations in the air molecules around us. So when we think about vibrating strings, the whole universe arising out of vibrations, it's something very interesting that the Torah already told us that, that God created, as we quoted earlier, that God brought manifest the physical, the visible universe through actual speech and it all began with his thought and then it came down into speech from his thoughts to speech to a manifest universe you know in hebrew there's something amazing that the word for a thing and the word for a word is the same a davar davar means a word right like divrei torah dvar torah a word of torah davar is a word and davar is also a thing davar a thing dvarim things dvarim is words and dvarim is are things a word and the thing are the same, right? Because the word gives rise to the thing. The vibration, the sound, the vibration actually creates that object, creates that thing. It's an ama amazing connection. See that? The valve. And what the Zohar says is like this. <clears throat> God tells us in the Zohar, Ma'ana, like me, just as I, the milula dile with my words 
avad, uh, avadit shamayim va'aretz, that I created the heavens and the earth, as it says on this pasuk that we just said, bidvar Hashem ha'shamayim nasu, uf achiat, so too can you do that. God says that just as I create the world through speech, created the world, bring about, manifest the world through speech, begins with thought and then comes out as speech, you too, uf achiat, you also can do that. Man also has that power. But the Zohar doesn't stop there. It says, Zakain inun, praiseworthy are those, the mishtad le beoraita, which means that spend time learning Torah, that busy themselves with Torah. What's the connection? The Zohar, the whole passage is a really fascinating passage, one of my favorites, just talking about really the power of Torah. A lot of what we said today is in this passage in the start of the Zohar, saying a lot of the same things in different words, that everything comes down to thought, thought and speech, thought manifesting as speech, speech manifesting, man, manifesting as things. This whole passage of the Zohar is saying how our words, specifically words of Torah, holy words, will create whole universes, create new Shemaim Ba'aretz create new worlds through the power of our speech. And it's saying specifically, Zakain, praiseworthy or meritorious or strong, whatever, are those the mishtad le beoraita, the people that learn Torah, because the whole point of Torah is to develop your mind. It's to sharpen your mind. It's to develop your thought process. It's to purify your speech, to purify your thoughts. Right? So much of Judaism is about proper speech, pure speech, holy speech, prayers, blessings. Throughout the day, we say hundreds of blessings, prayers on everything. It all comes down to speech and thought. Judaism is all about cleansing your thoughts, cleansing your words, and that has real power. It's not just a nice thing to do and to be a good person, to speak nicely and to have nice thoughts. It actually has real power for the world around us. And so that's what God says, big secret in the, in the Zohar, that God says, just as I create the world and create worlds through speech, so do you. And if you want to create a beautiful world and you want to make a good world around you, then the key to that is mishtad le beoraita, that learning Torah is how you develop your mind. That's the path towards rectifying speech and thought and action, all three. And uh, just to finish with string theory, something that's really amazing. There's a few different versions of string theory. Uh, one says that there are 10 potential strings dimensions. One says 11 and one says 26, which is really interesting because those numbers fit right into Judaism because in Kabbalah as well, we have 10 kind of main dimensions, right? We talked about this before. The 10 spherot are the 10 key dimensions of Kabbalah that permeate the entire universe. And string theory, the leading string theory says that there are 10 strings. And it's amazing because in Kabbalah, we also say that everything boils down to 10 spherot, that everything comes out of 10 spherot. And in string theory, everything comes out of 10 dimension, 10 dimensions, 10 strings. Another version of string theory says 11, which is okay too, because as we spoke about before, the 10 spherot, there's a hidden 11th sphere over here where the Dalit is called Da'at. Right? And there's Keter Chochma Bina. And then sometimes Keter is hidden and there's another 11th sphere over here called Da'at. So you get Chochma Bina Da'at, which is where Chabad comes from. Right? Chabad is Chochma Bina Da'at. So sometimes you have an 11th sphere. And in the most kind of deepest Kabbalistic texts, there's actually a discussion of 26 spheres. So I'm not going to get into how we get to 26. But we've seen the number 26 before because the number 26 represents Hashem, right? God's name is 26. yud Hey vav Hey is 26. And we talked about how that's encoded in the letter Aleph, which is the letter which represents oneness. Aleph is one. Aleph is oneness. Aleph represents God. And Aleph is made up of a Vav and two Yuds. A Yud, Yud, Vav. Vav is six. Yud is 10. Yud, Yud, Vav is 26 again. So the Aleph encodes that oneness. It's one and it's 26. And 26 is Hashem, yud Hey vav Hey, and Hashem is one. Hayahu Vehiyeh is, was, always, will be. Hashem Echad, God, the oneness of the whole universe, the consciousness that permeates the whole universe. And there are 26, up to 26 dimensions, depending on how we look at the spherot. And in string theory as well, we, usually there's 10. Sometimes we thought there are 11. And there could even be 26, depending on how you break them down. Generally, we say 10. And the same thing in string theory. It's something really amazing. That with all that science and math, the way you calculate things, when you plug everything in, what do you get? 
either 10 dimensions or 11 or 26. That's pretty amazing. And Kabbalah is just like that. Uh, we're out of time, so I'm not going to get to the multiverse. We'll leave that for another time. Uh, we'll leave that for another time. Uh, so if uh, that's it for, for this part. So just to, to, to recap a little bit, I mean, if there's one message to take out of this is that your mind and your speech is more powerful than you know. Uh, we affect the world around us every day. And that's something that both Kabbalah and quantum physics agree on, right? That we are like little lords of creation and we affect the world around us each day. So be careful with your speech and thought and let's only have positive, pure speech and thought. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we can do some questions now.